Hello and welcome to this repair description and overview for an A&R Cambridge A60 audio amplifier. This amplifier came in from a customer into the workshop a few days ago and it really is a classic British amplifier from a construction and design point of view. The distinctive era wooden case and metal construction really was the example of this sort of time period and when you look at the operational manual it sort of dated uh, circa around sort of nine, 1998 up to about the year uh, 2000. And it's interesting for the serial number of the amplifiers because this particular version of operator manual, which is version 6, quotes uh, it's applicable to um, units which are above uh, 25,000 plus. So it sort of indicates to you that a um, and really produced a lot of these amplifiers over a period of time and there's many of them still out there working very very well and in this case of course the, the uh, task ahead was to restore the amplifier back to uh, work in order. When you look from the front uh, multiple inputs can be selected so no electronic switching of that time period and when you look at the rear of the amplifier you have the five pin DIN uh, input plugs which is classic and you can connect directly a turntable to the amplifier um, for moving magnet type and uh, when you look at the actual uh, manual itself it also describes uh, different modules that you can plug in depending for example if you wanted to uh, connect a turntable which had a moving coil type stylus rather than the, uh, the moving magnet Associated also with the input selector switches, you can see that there's a filter switch and this is tuned or the circuit is tuned to 7.5 kilohertz. And really the thinking behind this is if you connect up a radio or maybe a tape player, then typically this uh, 7.5 kilohertz filter can be selected, which will just reduce the overall noise coming in from there. Um, and that beats, as the manual states, having to turn down, for example, the uh, the, tab, the treble control to try and compensate for that. So you have dedicated selection. And then you also have a mono selection button as well. So rather than the two channels um, being processed separately, what happens here is that the two uh, channels really get mixed. So instead of being separately amplified, they're, they're mixed together. And then that is routed then to the left and right channel outputs. And that would be also the same for the tape monitor function as well. And overall, nice construction. So when you look, uh, still base plate. Uh, the main amplifier board screws directly onto there, providing a common ground. You can see the large toroidal transformer and also the large power supply electrolytic capacitors. And the front fascia and the rear really is right angled uh, metal. So they've just simply cut the necessary slots out and they're just held in position on the base plate by a number of fixing screws so from a service point of view quite straightforward to work on really what you have to do is just to undo the grub screws on each one of the metal knobs on the front fascia and then remove the fixing screws underneath and then you can move that forward uh, under the screws on the main board and then the same then for the rear uh, and then you're able to lift up the main amplifier um, to get access, of course, then to the to the solder side. Now, the issue with this amplifier is it came in with a defective right channel. So if you look at the video, you can see, as commonly I put up here, a series of photographs. So the first one really is showing you a number of burnt out components on the board in the right hand channel section. Um, this typically indicates excess current draw. Now, you also have two fuses that have blown as well. So inside this amp, you have a total of four fuses. So there are two power supply fuses, which are rated as quick blow, as it says on the circuit board, which are rated at 3.15 amps. And then for the speaker protection outputs, you have, again, a quick blow or fast blow fuse rated at 1.6 amps. So the right channel fuse are blue, and then also one of the uh, power supply protection fuses has also failed. And as I say, you can see a number of burnt out components. And there's also a small signal transistor, a uh, BFR series, which is in the driver stage of the right channel, which is blown off the circuit board completely. So you can see the pins and then a bit of the plastic encapsulation still remains. So sometimes the question sort of comes through on the channel, really, how do you sort of undertake a repair like this? Well, as I always say, it's a systematic approach, right? So. The first thing that you do here is you're really replacing the components which you can visually see which have failed. 
uh, and knowing that this sort of excess current draw would be due to a failure of the output transistors it's very easy just to simply put your multimeter on there do a resistance check and sure enough the two um, tip um, 3055 transistors have failed short circuit to collect uh, uh, to emitter and that's the first part of the process so just really get the board up and then desolder those components and then replace them so the resistors two of them are 120 ohms each and then the tip 3055s and then the BFR series transistor now with regard to the outputs you'll see on this amp what you have is an insulation uh, silicon like it's like a, a like, which should be like a silicon insulating washer now normally typically for that you wouldn't require any heat sink compound but I and R have put heat sink compound on there and the replacement transistors from the original manufacturer are now discontinued so the latest transistors have to be installed and again I say this many times just simply make sure that you source them from a reputable component uh, supplier and these transistors were then installed what's a little bit tricky is just trying to get the alignment for the holes because of course the heat sink is pre-drilled and you don't want to put the fixing screw through and then damage the insulation because these are non-tab isolated so what happens here is you have to ensure that when you put the fixing screws in that the plastic insulation washer that goes through the hole of the transistor itself and then the screw um, doesn't uh, cut through the insulation material and the best way to do that is once you've installed the transistors is simply you use your meter on resistance and then just check the resistance uh, ensure that uh, you don't have a short circuit between the metal tab of the transistor and the heatsink because the metal tab is the collector of these transistors and of course internally it's used then to transfer the heat directly to the heatsink to maintain stability thermal stability but also ensure that the transistor itself doesn't go into what we call thermal runaway which could then result in the destruction of the device one other point as well is when these amplifiers were designed of course the design engineer would design the circuit to get the best performance for a particular device bear in mind that this particular output transistor replacement here will not be identical in terms of characteristics as per the original but of course from a design point of view that would have been taken into consideration at the time but from a repair point of view then you know that that isn't considered but remember that the output transistors fundamentally are driving the current or the higher low current then directly uh, for the speaker uh, coils and then uh, and not so much as a voltage amplifier that you would see in the earlier uh, part of the amplifier stages then when you have completed that work the next process then is really to just go in systematically checking each one of the components in the output stage and it quickly became apparent that although these components uh, didn't look visually damaged in fact they were so what you had there was a whole series of different transistors which had failed and then the emitter resistors are also shown and these are 0.22 ohms and this is very very common so whenever you get excess current draw failure of output transistors what you'll find is that the transist the, the resistors then go up in circuit but no visual indication then so just to sort of run through all of the different components that failed on this amplifier so you had q121 on 120 so that's the tip3055 you then had uh, failsafe fuse or fs202 which is the 3.15 amp fuse which is quick blow and then there's also the fs102 marked on the board which is 1.6 amp and then you have r103 sorry r163 and r164 which are the 0.22 ohm emitter resistors and then there's r157 and 159 which are both 120 ohms and then you have q117 and q116 so those are bc557 and bc547 and then finally q118 and q119 and those are bfr39 and bfr79 so once all those components have been checked there was additional measurements made to ensure for example that there was no other components that had failed and what i always say is anyone who's undertaking a repair right just spend that additional time to do the checks it's nothing worse than you think okay i think i've got everything and then you power it up and then you know a lot of the hard work that you've already done then is it just goes up and literally up in smoke and um, remember to power up any amplifier that you're repairing via the dim ball tester now once that had all been done and the amplifier powered up fine the next minute or the next thing to do then is to set up the the actual um, 
bias on the airport transistors or, or the IQ here and it's a little bit elaborate for the A60 so what you have to do <coughs> I have to remove the 3.15 amp fast blue fast blow fuses in the power supply and then you have to connect in there a 15 ohm 5 watt resistor and what you're simply measuring is the voltage across there and typically from startup it should read about 500 to 600 millivolts and then you have the two uh, preset potentiometers on the board to set the uh, the current and that's RV2 and RV102 and you make a slight adjustment and increase it by about 0.2 volts and then leave the amplifier running and you should typically measure then about 1.4 to 1.6 volts and make sure that it does not exceed 2 volts and once that is done then the amplifier then is perfectly aligned also as well for this amp you had a lot of issues associated with the volume control pot balance pots and the reason is that there was dirt which was coating all the carbon tracks when you look from the top you could gain access but it's very very difficult to try and get any cleaning material in there so the potentiometers were removed then check with the multimeter and what you could find is that they were a little bit unstable um, and also as well you, you, you could definitely see there was a difference between the resistance tracks between each one of the gangs or channel A channel B so once the potentiometers were removed then you could then get in there with deoxid rotate fill it up backwards and forwards multiple times and lo and behold that completely restored those potentiometers and then once they were back in the amplifier completely noise free volume completely balanced and then the other work that had to be carried out then was just simply to clean the uh, headphone jack socket make sure that you know those contacts are all good and then when you see on the back of the amplifier you have switched and unswitched terminals for the speakers this is common and all it simply means is switch means that if you plug in the headphone jack and you have the speakers connected it effectively will disconnect the speakers unswitched you and you plug your headphones in then there's no change between the output and the and the headphones i.e the, the sound is coming through both sets on your headphones and also your rear speaker connections and then really then to complete this repair uh, just to make a visual inspection and because the board has been raised up and down multiple times you just need to check the connections or the wire connections going back to the speaker terminals and one of those had sort of come loose so then just to resolder and then the same also for the power supply which comes from the transformer these are the power connectors very very brittle wire so again all remade off and then finally um, full functional test so amplifier left on for a period of time um, play music all good with speaker connectors 8 ohm speakers connected and then finally you just simply add the uh, the task here then to uh, to clean the amplifier and the amplifier is restored back to sort of factory condition and will now give the uh, the owner many many uh, years hopefully of listening pleasure and uh, as I said at the start of the video you know really a, a great amplifier and definitely worth the time to uh, to repair it and in the repair description below I've put in the links so you if you want you can download the service manual and the service manual is like old school of this era so it gives you very detailed information about the circuit design and also the engineers have given you some insight as to how you would repair the amplifier and it also details all of the different upgrades that they've made to the design of this amplifier over a period of time so this is really really good information um, and so if you're an engineer maybe looking to start repairing amplifiers sometimes working on the older equipment will probably help you a lot more because these service manuals are very very informative uh, whereas the newer sort of stuff you know it tends to just be a schematic or in some, some cases there's, there's there's nothing at all right so uh, as I say this amplifier all up and working now and really a joy you know it took a number of hours to restore it but once it's done you know under that load and, and test condition really producing an outstanding and beautiful sound so to close off uh, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, this repair description and overview and uh, I wish you all well until uh, the next time take care bye bye